Hi there, uh, my name is Isis Mentith Wilwright. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting at the Eurovision's 2022 conference. I presented last year on Israel and Eurovision, um, and I'm presenting again this year um, on why the Eurovision stage matters for Ukraine. This was an article that was pub uh, commissioned by Mace magazine and that will be coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, I want to thank Irving for having me on again and I also want to thank the three Eurovision academics I interviewed for this piece, um, Dr Jess Carniel, um, Dr Catherine Baker and Dr Paul Jordan. Um, I'm currently doing my master's finals at the moment so I sadly didn't have time to create a bit of a more complex uh, presentation but I'm just going to read you out the article and hope you enjoy it. Please come with lots of questions. Okay. The last 45 days have been a living nightmare for Ukraine after Putin's horrific invasion. In a short time, cities and districts have been decimated and millions of lives changed forever, as Ukrainians are forced to fight, flee or worse. While the world watches in horror, Ukrainians have defiantly challenged an invasion that seeks to absorb the country into a greater Russia. At the very distant backdrop to this catastrophe have been preparations for this year's Eurovision Song Contest. The international songwriting competition, often mischaracterized as frivolous, may well seem totally irrelevant in the current climate of war. But over 66 years, Eurovision has served as a crucial ground on which countries have performed their statehood and cultural autonomy. Eurovision is one of the most popular televised competitions in the world, with over 40 participating countries. Ukraine has been one of its most successful competitors since they first participated in 2003, winning twice in 2004 and 2016. It has forged the careers of some of the nation's most celebrated musicians, Ruslana, Jamala and Verkash Sadushka. In, conflict, in a conflict that rests on Ukraine's independence as a sovereign nation, the Eurovision stage has provided a unique platform to expose Europeans to Ukrainian voices, distinguishing themselves from the bloc identity of the USSR. Participation in Eurovision has come to symbolise proximity to the very idea of Europe. This will be a defining feature of the 2022 contest, as the European community severs its cultural and economic borders with Russia through sanctions. So far, Russia has been banned from participating, while Ukraine's contestants Kalush Orchestra are tipped to win. The song Stefania is fast becoming an anthem of resistance through its presentation of Ukrainian heritage, whilst its members are currently actively serving on the front lines. This year, lots of people have been tuning in to Eurovision as an offshoot of the coverage of the war. Yet the contest has consistently interlocked with important historical events for Ukraine. In the early noughties, a swathe of ex-Yugoslavian and ex-Soviet states entered Eurovision as independent nations. This was a crucial exercise in cultural state building and soft power relations. Winning on their second try with Ruslana's infectious Wild Dances in 2004, an independent Ukraine was given their first opportunity to host an international event. The BBC's frequent Eurovision pundit, known to some as Dr Eurovision, academic Paul Jordan, explained to me that Ruslana's song depicted a Western Carpathian culture sexualised and packaged up for Eurovision. A mix of trambitas, horns and traditional arkan dancing sung in both Ukrainian and English languages, it bore the new style of ethnopop. While dances was a phenomenon and stayed in the European charts for some 97 weeks, at a conference afterwards, Rosanna declared, I want my country to open up before you with friendship and hospitality. I would like you to forget about Chernobyl. As the victors, Ukraine was to host the 2005 contest. But in late 2004, protests erupted after a general election, which was characterised by voter intimidation and electoral fraud. The leading candidates were Viktor Yushchenko and Viktor Yanukovych and the results were seen to be rigged by the authorities in favour of the latter. The ensuing anti-corruption protests, dubbed the Orange Revolution, succeeded. In January 2005, Yushchenko was elected president in a clean vote, and the slogan for the upcoming Eurovision contest was Awakening. Dr Catherine Baker, Professor of Cold War History, International Relations and Cultural Studies at Hull University, explained to me that the contest was a chance for Yushchenko's new government to show an open dem and democratic face to the rest of Europe. Former Eurovision winner Ruslana became an icon for the revolution. She later joined Yushchenko's Our Ukraine Party and became a politician. Ukraine's entry that year was titled Raznom Nas Bahato or together we are many and we cannot be defeated. It was by Green Jolly and had become an unofficial anthem for the revolution. 
played at rallies across the country in the months prior to this selection for Eurovision. The government took the procurement of Eurovision very seriously. Tourism was one part of the appeal, but the competition was seen as a wide opportunity to broadcast Ukraine as a liberal, modern nation. Undoubtedly, this was a political choice. A small government elite effectively chose a Western narrative of Ukrainian identity, explains Dr. Jordan. The government effectively deciding what Ukrainian culture was. In 2007, Varka Shadzushka's Dancing the Lasha Tumbai provided another moment of cultural gravitas. The song went down in Eurovision history for Verka's vibrant and shimmering performance. Hidden with it, within it, there was an age-old sneaky way of singing Russia goodbye, according to Jess Carniel of the University of Southern Queensland, who I also spoke to. Its chorus of Lasha Tumbai is a coded, coded rhyme, just say the words out loud. In February 2022, Verka announced that going forwards, he is ditching the code and will only sing it as Russia goodbye from now on because of the invasion. Eurovision paralleled Ukraine's political tensions again in 2016, just two years after Kiev's Euromaidan clashes of 2013, in which protesters came out in favour of European integration. The protest was sparked by the Ukrainian government's sudden decision not to sign the European Union-Ukraine Association Agreement, instead choosing closer ties to Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union. Contestant Jamala won that year with the song 1944. It was an emotional ballad about Stalin's deportation of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians from Crimea to Central Asia during World War II. Not only had Jamala's family members been affected, but the song spoke to a contemporary situation during Russia's annexation of Crimea and the Donbass. For Russia to have lost Ukraine was bad, but for Russia to have lost Ukraine with a song about Crimea, let's just say they weren't very happy, says Dr. Jordan who served as a member of Ukraine's communication team that year. Jamala's victory not only implied tacit support for Ukraine's narrative of the conflict in Crimea, as 50% of the points are scored through voting, but it also gave Ukraine soft political power during a decisive time for its geopolitical standing. Yet again, it was to host the competition. We can think of Jamala's performance as inviting a European audience to join in a shared community of memory, reflects Dr. Baker. In February 2022, Jamala performed a devastating rendition of 1944 on the German show 12 Points, where it decides its contestant. Its opening lines, when the strangers are coming, they come to your house, they kill you and say, we're not guilty, were painted in a new light now that Jamala herself has become a refugee, having fled to Turkey with her children. Speaking of her ideal to News Channel routers, she said that realising she had to leave, I was shocked, it felt like a nightmare. The impact of 1944 will likely have contributed to the contemporary responses about the war in Ukraine, says Dr. Baker. When the full scale of invasion of Ukraine did come and the European public had to decide whether Putin or Zelensky were right, that narrative that viewers had seen when Eurovision six years ago will have formed some people's background knowledge of Ukraine. Having now become a symbol of its own, the power of the song 1944 has been transformed. The selection process after 2017 mirrored an escalation of tensions between Russia and Ukraine. While hosting the contest, Ukraine banned Russian contestant Yulia Samilova due to an unauthorised visit to Crimea. In 2019, contestant Maruv, who had won the public vote on TV show Vidbo, deciding Ukraine's selection, withdrew from the competition. Claiming to have been asked to sign a contract that banned him from performing in Russia, he asserted that he didn't want to be used as a public tool. This year's contest reflects a devastating new chapter in Ukrainian history. Ukraine is represented by Kalush Orchestra, a rap group formed in 2019 and consisting of Olev Suk, Ihor Dijanchunk and MC Kilerman. Named after a village in the Carpathian Mountains of which its members originate, their song Stefania is written about Ola's mother and combines modern hip-hop with traditional Ukrainian folklore sounds. Although they are widely now widely tipped to win the competition, their path to Eurovision wasn't simple. Initially coming second place on Vidba behind Alina Pash. Pash was later withdrawn from competing due to an alleged unauthorised trip to Crimea in 2015, of which she denied. Kalusha has not been spared from service. While people reflect on their potential success, the reality of their situation remains grim. I could not enjoy it while I'm worried for my loved ones. The war separated me and my girlfriend, Ole told Brutus, 
He himself is running a 20-person strong volunteer group, providing medical supplies and helping refugees flee. Another member fights for the territorial defence team in Kiev. Ole said of the song to the Sky News, It's an anthem for Ukraine and everybody is singing it. Originally the song was dedicated to my mother and now it's a song for all mothers. The lyrics are a call for home. Sing me a lullaby. I want to hear your native word. These words have a renewed cultural imperative if they are able to sing them in May. Dr. Baker explains that Stefania stands for the resilience of all countries that have been torn apart by invasion, still passing the national culture and language down to the next generation. Despite the uncertainty and horrific bombing of Kiev's television tower leaving the capital in the dark, the Ukrainian television union, UA First, confirmed Kalusha's participation in Eurovision via the Instagram account. The competition is fast becoming an important avenue for condemnation of Russia and for European solidarity. If Ukraine wins this year, I think that it would be a very powerful sense of solidarity and a strong symbol, predicts Dr. Jordan. Of course, when musing about a Ukrainian victory, the first thing that must be considered is the physical safety of Kalush, the Ukrainian Eurovision community and Ukraine in general. But the importance of Eurovision as a cultural site was explained best by Ola. I cannot say what's going to be in the future, but I think that Eurovision is a good way to make all the world sing Ukrainian songs and no Ukrainian rap. This moment is worthy of intrigue, not only because culture is one battleground where Russian aggression is being resisted, but because its stage offers a unique look into contested realities of Europeanness, however contradictory these borders may be. As Dr. Carniel suggests, the idea that it was silly or frivolous to think about Eurovision at a time like this is wrong. It isn't. This is precisely the time where the meaning and significance of something like Eurovision can come into clear view. Ukrainian defiance has proved to be interwoven with the Eurovision Song Contest, and this year will continue that cultural thread. Thank you so much.